let's get started if there are no more questions so today we are going to talk about uh, learning from demonstrations and imitation learning so as you recall in reinforcement learning one of the big issues that we found is data inefficiency and the second one we found was how to communicate rewards because designing rewards as we saw both in the lecture and the assignment is that it can be challenging so one very natural way to communicate to an agent what to do is to demonstrate the task itself right so that is what we are going to look in this lecture what are the kind of challenges which happen when we try to demonstrate the task and what techniques are available to overcome those limitations so i'm going to start with probably the first industrial robot called unimate and this is also one of the earliest example where the robot was programmed to repeat what the human wanted the robot to do so i mean so this robot if you look at it this person uh, is you know moving his joystick and the robot is moving and then the robot memorizes that for every state what action was inputted by the person and then it just repeats uh, that action over and over again right and you know turns out you know a lot of robots that we use even today are based on a similar principle you know it's super straightforward that for every state you program what the action is so the environment is not changing or if your task is not changing then you know these kind of techniques can work very well right so the first thing that we have is memorize and repeat right pretty good for industrial tasks where there is little variance in executing it so you know the the drawback of this technique is that it cannot handle changes it cannot handle any uncertainty and is also very very specific to the task that it has been trained or it has memorized so obviously you know we want to go beyond these limitations and be able to handle changes specifically if the environment is changing so one of the most popular example of this is from this demonstration called Alvin from Carnegie Mellon so what happens you know is that a human driver is driving this truck and we are recording um uh, like what is the steering angle and the accelerator and the brake which the human is inputting right so this is the car you know you know first driven by a human operator and then driven on its own so it's almost like you know the boots like the one of the first demonstrations or one of the first efforts towards self driving cars you can trace it back to alvin right so this is you know one uh you know uh, application or you know one kind of a problem setup where you know it's very hard to write down rules for how to drive a car but it is very easy to demonstrate how to drive the car similarly you know another example we're going we consider that you know i need to arrange this block so over here this human is moving the robot and the robot is also able to observe the environment right? what we have access to is the state of the world given by x and we also have access to the robot's actions so essentially what we want to do is to learn a mapping which can go from x to a because if we can do that then the robot can you know given the state execute the desired action so formally speaking you know we might have n demonstrations of a particular task right so over here each demonstration is n time steps but that is not really necessary and then what we want is given a state that the robot is in it should be able to output an action so how can we solve this problem right i mean the simplest thing we could do is we can do supervised learning where we take all the state action pairs and train it with supervised learning and get a policy out and this policy could be parameterized for example by a neural network so before we you know jump ahead uh, i'll just talk about some nomenclature which becomes a bit tricky but it's good to just clarify it in the very beginning so one uh, let's see the 
some animation went wrong on the right, but let's ignore it. So, uh, so one thing is, you know, if I have access to these trajectories of the form state action state action, then if I learn a mapping which can go from any state to action, this is typically called as learning from demonstrations or also known as behavior cloning. There's another setup possible where we only have access to states. Right, there is no access to actions. Now, what's an example of this? An example of this is, for example, you're watching a video on YouTube, right? Or someone is demonstrating a task and you are observing the person perform a task. So in that case, we don't know the action, but what we do know is an observation sequence of the states which were encountered. So typically, you know, this setup is known as imitation learning or observational learning. It's more generic in the sense that, you know, the human, we don't need to know the actions, but only the sequence of states. Now you will also find, you know, sometimes, you know, imitation learning is used as an umbrella term to mean all of these things, right? I mean, imitation learning could mean learning from demonstrations, behavior cloning, or even observational learning. But I find it, you know, this to be a good distinction between learning from demonstrations of behavior cloning and imitation learning is whether you have access to actions at the train time or if you don't have access to actions at the train time. Any questions over here? Yeah, so there's one question which comes up, you know, what happens when the data provided isn't perfect or suboptimal? I think we'll touch upon that. Uh, in this lecture. Any other questions on the nomenclature or the problem setup so far? No, so let's march ahead. So as we discussed, you know, if we're doing learning from demonstrations, you know, we could do, you know, supervised learning. And, you know, how do we do supervised learning? We have this expert data and we are trying to fit our policy, which is given by, you know, this function i, which has parameters theta, right? So this is just maximum likelihood estimation. And we only do maximum likelihood estimation on the states for which the actions are available. So now if we end up learning this policy, sometimes there can be issues. Right. So one issue which can happen is, for example, suppose the expert provided this trajectory and this was, you know, like a car which you wanted to drive around. But, you know, if the system ends up making, you know, one error or a couple of errors or even small errors, the trajectory might end up deviating. So because the trajectory has deviated, it ends up reaching the state space, for example, over here, where it has no guidance from the expert on what to do right? because these states were never in my training set. So it is possible that in these states, the policy would output actions which are non-sensitive. So this problem is called as the covariate shift problem. So the clone policy can go out of distribution. So there's one question which has come up, which is in imitation learning or behavior cloning, would the maximum performance be limited by expert trajectory or would there be a way to perform even better than the expert? That's an excellent question, Dongchi, and we will touch upon that shortly. So if, if you're just doing behavior cloning, you are many times limited to the performance of the expert. I mean, sometimes if you're able to get a ranking uh, between trajectories, then you can outperform the experts. Um, otherwise, you can combine demonstrations with reinforcement learning. You know, something we'll look into very shortly. Okay. Uh, any any questions on uh, the covariate shift problem? No. Any suggestions on how we may you know solve this? How can we solve the covariate shift problem?
Uh, seems like there are no suggestions right now. Maybe something came up on the chat. Let me see what came up. Take more trajectories. Yes. So, you know, one possibility is that we can keep on taking more and more trajectories, right? I mean, so then the question will become is, you know, could we do better than just passively collecting more trajectories? So, you know, let's look at that and, you know, we'll try to overcome this covariate shift problem. So, you know, one way you can think of it is that, okay, you could collect more trajectories, but there's a specific distribution of trajectories for which you want to collect data, right? Or for which you want to get expert supervision. If those are the kind of trajectories, so those are the trajectories in which the agent is more likely to end up in. So instead of blindly collecting or having an expert perform the task and collect data, maybe what we should do is, you know, we should run the agent, figure out, you know, in what states uh, it ends up where it cannot predict a sensical action and provide supervision for that. So this is, you know, the idea behind the algorithm called as dagger. The algorithm is quite simple, right? So you have, so the blue line over here illustrates the expert, uh, or sorry, the blue line, you know, illustrates the set of states which were executed by the agent. And for each state which is executed by the agent, we query the expert and we get the expert action. So instead of passively collecting the data, right, we are actively collecting the data depending on the current policy. So once agent executes this policy, we end up getting this new data. We combine this with the previous data, and that is where the name aggregate data set comes in, where we aggregate new data with the previous data. So if you go in the full form of it, you'll see it is data aggregation, you know, comes in, you know, when you try to, I mean, see the full form of DAGO. And then you take this aggregated data set and you perform supervised learning on it. You know, and then we end up getting a new policy and then we execute this new policy. Right? And then we end up, you know, performing this loop till the time the agent can successfully execute the task that we started off with. To see an example of it, you know, consider the task which we had, you know, initially where the robot had to pick up this block and, you know, uh, like screw it in. So what you'll see is, for example, over here, the hand of the robot goes too far away. So let me, you know, repeat, you know, replay this video. So the robot first has to grasp this block. So, uh, let's see, right? So initially you see the hand is going too far away. So the human stops it, corrects the hand, right? And, you know, so the human is providing data depending on how the system is doing. Right. So they are, so, you know, let's formally see how this algorithm is working and then we can have a short discussion. So initially we have a data set, which might be empty. You know, we might have, you know, a random policy to begin with. Now we sample a T-step trajectories using my current policy pi i. This gives us a data set. And for this data set, for every state, we query the expert, right? Where expert is my pi star s. We get the new data set on which we train, you know, a classifier. And what we do is we adjust the new policy to be, you know, beta times beta i times, you know, pi star plus i minus beta times pi hat i, right? So we are just updating uh, the policy that we have by a little bit, you know, every time. So that's all, uh, you know, we are doing. Now, if you look at it, you know, more formally, I mean, behavioral cloning or you know, not more formally, but in a, you know, in a mathematical expression form. So in behavioral cloning, we're taking an expectation from a set of states, which were given by the expert. In Dagger, we have the same objective function, but we are getting states from by executing the policy. 
So that's pretty much the idea behind Dagger. Now you could say, well, instead of providing supervision for all states, as the policy goes on, you know, maybe you have some measure of uncertainty of where the policy is not doing well and only provide expert supervision on that, right? So by doing some of those techniques or tricks, you know, you could reduce the amount of supervision that we are getting from expert. So the base, the baseline dagger is where for every state we get the expert supervision, but one could be more clever and choose a subset of states to get expert supervision from. And this becomes important if expert supervision is expensive. So, okay, so if we come to behavior cloning plus dagger, you know, it overcomes the problem of covariate shift, but there's still, you know, problems which remain. You know, for example, collecting demonstration is quite tedious. You know, moving the robot around is not really fun. It can also be costly. Many times, you know, demonstrations are suboptimal. And, you know, at the end of the day, we are still learning, you know, policies which can only perform one particular task. Right? So now before, you know, we try to get into these issues, any question on Dagger? No. Okay. So, so one question which you know comes up is you know to, in order to address the tediousness is how can we get demonstrations? Right. So one possibility is to use the human expert to get demonstrations. You know? Other is to get use privileged information. So recall from you know two lectures ago when we were doing sim to real, we looked at how you know, we could use some kind of privileged information, right, to train a policy first, and then, you know, train a student policy, which did not require that privileged information. So this was one example where we are generating demonstration data by using some privileged information where, you know, more general methods, you know, some planner or some policy optimization method can work because we have more information, right? And then we can, you know, treat the output of this planner slash policy optimization method as the expert. And then, you know, go on and train a policy based on the sensory observations that I'm going to get in my, in my evaluation time and output the actions. So, you know, another example of this is, you know, you can think of, uh, you know, guided policy search is one more example that you can think in a similar vein. So over here, the idea was to perform a bunch of, you know, manipulation tasks, which involve, you know, fitting this, you know, shape in this particular, um, you know, holes over here or hanging the hangers, doing the bottle cup and so on. So how did this work? So at training time, you know, what do what we assume is that we know exactly the location of say, the cube and you know the shape. Right? So I have access to low dimensional state information. And you know, we could use some techniques from optimal control, such as trajectory optimization, to find actions. Right? Similar to what we were doing in the quadruped locomotion. But what we want is, you know, this system to work from just camera inputs because we may not know the exact location or the exact state at test time. So now we're going to do, you know, imitation learning where now from images, I'm going to predict the same action back. So, so the, the first step is to train a policy just from the states and then you know, to get supervision that we can use to train something that can work directly from observation. So the takeaway over here is, 
you know, trajectory optimization of policy learning is easier in state space. It requires privileged information, but this can be a useful source to generate expert data. And then we can imitate this expert data directly from sensory observations. Right? And this means that there's no privileged information required at evaluation time. So you know, this is the showing the neural network architecture, which was used by this particular work to output action, right? So it's an RGB image, a bunch of convolutional networks, followed by some fully connected networks, which output motor talks directly. And, you know, we can see some results of, you know, the system you know, performing the tasks that we talked about initially. So, okay, I mean, what the system showed is that, you know, that by leveraging privileged information, we are able to train a policy which generalizes to some extent. For example, the bottle can, you know, move around, be at different locations, and still the system can work. Okay. So, you know, what we looked at right now was, you know, maybe, you know, how we could reduce the tediousness to an extent by leveraging privileged information. So we're going to come back to this question and see at some other methods which can make letting demonstration be less tedious. But you know, let's pause for a moment and let's consider suboptimal demonstrations and ask the question, how can we perform better than the demonstrations that have been given? So you know, as was pointed out earlier in the lecture, that if I just have expert demonstrations, you know, it might be hard to, to go beyond experts. But we know, you know, instead of, you know, relying just on experts, we could use reinforcement learning and the machine can automatically figure out decision-making rules. But RL is sample inefficient. And this pretty much motivates using RL plus demonstrations together, right? It is beneficial to both of them so demonstrations, you know, improve sample efficiency of RL. Now, why this happens, you know, intuitively you can think of demonstrations solving the exploration problem because they will get you somewhere close to the goal, right? But may, they may not tell you the optimal path to go to the goal. So if you just start with an RL agent from scratch, you are pretty much doing random actions, right? So with demonstrations, you know, you could overcome you know, that big hum of not doing random actions, but doing something meaningful, which is getting you close to the goal, right? So therefore demonstrations can improve sample efficiency of RL. Right? And on the other hand, you know, RL can help us go beyond the performance of the demonstrator. So now let's see how, how this works. So first let's recall PQN. Right, where we had image as input and we're predicting the Q values for different actions. And just to uh, go a bit more in the architecture, you know, this was the replay buffer from which we sample. We samples are fed into a neural network. And you know, we update the neural network, we collect more data, put it back in the replay buffer and this whole loop repeats. So suppose now, if we have some demonstrations, right, how could we leverage these demonstrations? Does anyone have you know, any thoughts or ideas in how we could easily integrate some demonstrations in the DQN framework? So maybe think about, you know, where is data sitting in DQN? So the data is sitting in the replay buffer. So maybe the, the simplest thing we can do is, well, we can just populate the replay buffer with demonstrations. This is exactly what this paper, DQ Learning from Demonstrations or DQFD did. So they take the demonstrations, put them in the replay buffer. We initialize the replay buffer with demos. Then we update the Q values with these demos. 
and then we start you know learning with reinforcement learning okay. and then you know when we are training with reinforcement learning we do not throw out these demos you know we retain these demos because sometimes the deep layer buffer can become too big and you have to flush out some of the old data but typically you keep the data which was coming from demonstrations and we can look at you know how these methods perform so the red line over here, so I'm showing you three Atari games over here. So the Y axis is the rewards and the X axis is the time. So the red line is if you just did imitation learning and you know green is if you just did uh, DQN and blue is you know when you did this DQFD which is combining demonstrations plus RL. So what you will notice is, you know, in some games, you know, you end up doing better than, you know, this imitation learning baseline. There are always exceptions. I mean, a few games, you know, you end up still doing worse. Uh, and, you know, many times either you are more sample efficient than RL or sometimes you can even, you know, outperform RL. So the kind of games in which you can expect to outperform RL our games where exploration was hard because it could happen because of hard exploration, you know, RL may not never find a good solution and demonstrations can, you know, really help you uh, resolve that. Right. But generally speaking, even if the exploration was somewhat easy, demonstrations would then help you in sample efficiency as is happening in a you know, game over here. Now we can take the same idea and, you know, apply it to continuous queue learning, which is DDPG FD. So over here, this person is gathering demonstrations. So he is you know, showing the robot what to do. Right over here, we want to insert this object uh, in its socket. So now we got some demonstrations, we put them in the replay buffer in DDPG, and then we are doing you know, DDPG optimization in the real world. So what you'll see is, you know, as time progresses, the agent, you know, ends up learning how to perform the task eventually. So, you know, this is the one of the most straightforward ways of using demonstrations is to add them into replay buffers. If you want more details, you know, you can go into these papers and read them. So now before we you know go and see more methods for using demonstrations i'm wondering if anyone has any questions so far so question is are these demo samples selected equally from the replay buffer with other samples so I believe, you know, you could have, you know, different sampling schemes. And if you, I think, look into these papers, you know, they will tell you, you know, how they go about it. I mean, typically what you do is initially you have demonstrations in your replay buffer, and then you would just train the Q value without collecting any new data for some time. You know, you have some burn-in period, and then you start collecting more data. So the idea is, that you know by having this burn-in period maybe your policy is almost as good as the demonstrations right which are there and then when you're collecting you know new data you know then you can maybe uniformly sample from demonstrations or the new data that you're collecting but you know if you want more specific you know values of those hyperparameters you know i would recommend um, going into these works and looking at them So, you know, in populating the replay buffer is, you know, one way of using demonstration, but there's somewhat of an indirect way of using demonstrations. So what we can do is, you know, we can, you know, use demonstrations much more directly. Right? For example, going back to this policy optimization from states to actions, 
right? Instead of just having the learning from demonstration loss, which is written on the top, what we're going to do is we're going to augment it with a loss or the, or the reinforcement learning loss, right? So over here, if you see the first term, is A is the advantage function. And this is, so this is the policy gradient term and the data is coming from the policy, right? Whereas, you know, we have the learning from demonstration cost with some weighting factor. And this is coming from the expert data. So over here, you know, you can do different things where you start off with a value of W, which is high initially, because you want to trust the demonstrations more and then decay it to a small value eventually. So, you know, this is yet another way to incorporate demonstrations along with reinforcement learning. And, you know, this method was utilized for, you know, doing some dexterous manipulation tasks, for example, you know, relocating the object, but also some, you know, tool use tasks, which can be quite hard to solve by reinforcement learning directly from scratch, right? Why is that? Because, you know, exploration can be quite challenging. If you have to lift up, you know, this hammer and then hammer it, you know, you require a large number of actions which need to happen in sync. So we can go and, you know, look at the results. So again, you know, the same thing, you know, we have Y axis is a reward and X axis is the amount of training time. The gray line is behavior cloning only. The red line is, you know, what we saw and the previous C, which was populating the replay buffer with demonstrations. And the green line, you know, is what their method is. So you could have done something different also, which is a variant of the method. So one thing you can do is instead of having the behavior cloning plus RL loss, you can use the demonstrations first to just pre-train the network, right, by using supervised learning and then fine tune it with RL, right? So in that case, the loss is not joined, but it is sequentially done. You know, that is a blue line. So what you see is, you know, even doing that is, you know, getting you quite close, except for maybe one task. Right? So, but, you know, instead of doing these two explicit stages, you know, you can just vary this parameter W, which can be big initially and then become small, which would say pretty much you're doing learning from demonstration initially. But as the rewards are going up, you know, you might end up trusting the reinforcement learning data much more. So this is, you know, like one more way of incorporating demonstrations. Any questions on this? So the question is, you know, why is behavior cloning only, you know, constant over time? Because in behavior cloning only, you're not collecting any additional data from the robot, right? You have your fixed data set on which you do supervised learning and you get a policy. Right? So they're just plotting the line to be consistent, but because they're collecting no data, the line is flat. Any more questions over here? No? Okay. So let's move ahead. Let's, let's consider, you know, another task. And, you know, this task is to, you know, maybe stack blocks, but even if you have to, you know, lift one block and put it, you know, this becomes, you know, quite challenging because exploration, you know, becomes challenging. So what this work is doing is, you know, it's trying to leverage demonstrations to, you know, overcome the exploration problem and then, you know, eventually go on to, you know, do some kind of uh, block stack. Now, so what we are going to see is, you know, how we can take, you know, just behavior cloning or, you know, this 
another reinforcement learning method called as hindsight experience replay, which we're going to you know look uh, in the future part of the course. But how do we actually you know get good performance than you know just doing RL? So to get intuition about it, right? So we were using this joint behavior cloning plus reinforcement learning loss as a before. So one question you could ask is, you know, is there something that we could be improving over here? So one thought is that if I'm combining behavior cloning plus RL loss, it may be, you know, I should only, you know, trust the behavior cloning loss if the value of the action predicted from the expert is higher than the value of the action predicted by the reinforcement learning loss. Right? So what we're going to do is we're going to modify our behavior cloning loss. Right? Instead of applying the behavior cloning loss for all states and actions, what we're going to say is, well, only if the Q value of the expert action is larger than the Q value of the action predicted by the policy is when I'm going to impose the behavior cloning loss. And so intuitively, you know, as training progresses, we are going to trust the policy more and more because it should probably, which should lead to higher reward. So this thing, which they called SQ filter, you know, helps you implement that intuition. And you know, the second thing you know, that they did was to have this idea of resets, which is you, know, you, start from, you start the robot from the same states as in the demonstrations. Now, you know, this reset thing is quite hard to implement in the real world because you know, matching the robot to the same state as was given by the expert is hard. But I think a good takeaway from this work is the idea of Q-filter, which is helping me decide when to use the behavior cloning loss and when to trust the reinforcement learning loss. So, you know, if we, you know, end up doing behavior cloning in this particular way, you know, we can solve, you know, some of these hard tasks, right? For example, even going and, you know, stacking five or six blocks which is quite challenging because the exploration is quite challenging. Now we can do you know performance comparison. So look at you know behavior cloning and you know their method and you know their methods with resets. So you know I would say don't pay so much attention to the resets part, but maybe pay more attention to behavior cloning plus what happens with Q filters. And what you see is you're getting a significant performance gain by applying this Q filtering idea. Any questions on this part? What does stack force parse and step mean? Like how are they different? So those are two different kinds of rewards. So a sparse reward is if you are say stacking, you know, block of four, you only get a reward if you stack all the four blocks. Stepwise is if you're getting a reward for stacking every block. Okay, okay, got it. Thanks. These are just two different setups over here. Any other questions? No? Okay. So, you know, let's march ahead and, you know, see how we can utilize demonstrations in more ways. So what we're going to ask is, you know, okay, right now we were blindly using the demonstration. We just thought of a demonstration as a time series. And then we tried to imitate that time series. But, you know, maybe there is some structure in the demonstration so we can use demonstrations to discover some skills Right. For example, in the block stacking one, instead of just copying for every state what the action is, 
maybe we can learn a skill of you know picking up a block or placing a block or you know pushing a block and then we can combine these skills to solve new tasks right so instead of directly imitating things for every state how about first we find skills and then we use reinforcement learning to decide how to combine these skills so you know let's look at how we might do this so suppose you know we have this game where you know this agent needs to go to the goal which is a cheese and this is a rat and it needs to go there and suppose we have expert data right and what do i mean by expert data i have state action trajectories uh, and a lot of them right now suppose you know instead of predicting just one state or oh, sorry one action from a state i want to predict a sequence of actions from the state and to make this job a bit easier you know maybe what we can do is we can try to cluster them right what this means is you know maybe what i can say is if i am in this state maybe now maybe i need to go and pick the block and now i need to place the block right so i can maybe reason in somewhat more abstract terms so to give you an intuition right so maybe if, if i have this you know ant which can you know walk in many directions maybe i want you know motion on say right to be one scale motion on left to be one scale or you know down to be one scale and so on so what we want to do is given the state and maybe a skill type i want to predict a sequence of actions now how are we going to do this so you know we have and okay before you know how we're going to do this you know let's look at you know what these skills will enable us right so suppose we have this game you know in which this agent has to go to this cheese thing and suppose we are able to learn these skills which are you know the moving left moving right and so on and so forth now if i go to a new game right say where this agent needs to go to this diamond but now there are you know these keys and these doors right so we have to collect the keys and then open the doors and then go over there right? so if i have some skills of how to navigate the maze you know solving this task is going to be easy because i can just combine these skills right? so you know what we can do is you know we can transfer these skills to potentially even solve new tasks which go beyond what was demonstrated right so you know that is what we are trying to build towards so how do we uh, do it so one way is you know i take my sequence of actions i encode it into some latent space z and from that latent space i am trying to again reconstruct my actions right i think i pressed the wrong button so what do i mean by reconstruct the actions i have my ground truth action trajectories and i'm trying to minimize the loss between my prediction and my ground truth and typically what we do is we constrain z to be a low dimensional embedding or the dimensionality of z is much smaller than the dimensionality of the sequence of actions so what that enables us to do is to essentially compress the space of actions into you know some kind of clusters and so you can think of you know this architecture as doing some kind of soft cluster right i mean this architecture is typically called as auto encoder because i we can ignore the state over here for now if i'm taking in a sequence of actions i am projecting it into a low dimensional space and then i am you know again trying to reconstruct the actions right so essentially i am trying to learn a clustering of sequence of actions so now what i can do is you know typically i would go from states to actions by a policy but instead now i can go from the state to predict the z and then i can use this decoder which maps z into a sequence of actions right 
so you know for for a moment assume that z was discrete right so if z was discrete maybe choice of z is equal to 1 might mean you know go forward choice of z is equal to 2 might mean you know go left or go right z is equal to 3 might mean you know come down but you know you could choose z to be discrete you could also choose z to be continuous till the time it's a contraction so over here now what we can do is we can freeze the decoder which is you know this part which is a mapping from z to actions and we can simply optimize theta z to predict z right so over here i can treat the z to be my action space and then do rl directly on z now does this make sense any I mean, what did it make sense of what we did? We took the actions, found a load action embedding of it, and now instead of planning in the action space, we are now planning in this low dimensional embedding space. So you know what I have is you know a poll for everyone. You know, so maybe to help us understand this in. you know somewhat more and you know, more intuitively so the claim which i'm going to make is you know that what is the poll is uh that you know planning in the z space is going to lead to better performance and what you see are you know two options in the or three options in the poll so you know i would you know encourage you to maybe think about a little bit and you know answer the poll or you know if what i just described doesn't make sense you know feel free to you know raise a question or just speak out and you know happy to go over again or explain things which were unclear yeah i had one question mm -hmm. so, so like can you say that like the pi theta z that we are actually learning here it's sort of like like a meta policy which is not mapping states to actions but mapping states to like short horizon policies in some way because z is giving you like map into a series of actions or something so you can i think instead of calling it meta i would call it hierarchical right because you can think of it you know there are two levels first i am predicting you know something more abstract which is z which might mean you know something like going left going right forward back and then that more abstract concept is instantiated by a sequence of actions i am not sure i mean if if you wanted to imply something when you said meta yeah oh i think yeah, hierarchical also makes sense okay yeah yeah i was basically trying to understand whether this really means that the policy which is like pi theta z which you're learning is not really a mapping from state to action anymore it's like a state to mapping from a state to like a lower level policy in a sense or you can think of it as you know some meta action if you want to call it right so z z you can term it as some meta action Does that make sense? Yes. So there's another question, you know, which has come up, which is in this method, do you roll out all the actions predicted by the decoder and wait for t plus k to evaluate again? In the formulation that I just described, yes. You know, you wait to roll out everything. I mean, there are variants where you can train both the decoder and the z simultaneously. but you know for now let's just assume the decoder is fixed and only trains it right so now i'm going to close the poll i still have a couple of missing votes so if you know people want to take the last shot you know five more seconds before we close okay well i'm going to close now let's see what what we all said 
so six of, six of us think that you know finding a policy in z space is better than the original action space because it visits more diverse states and you know nine of us think you know because it reduces time horizon of the decision process so maybe someone who said because it visits more diverse states you know do you want to you know maybe say why it visits more diverse why is that true I don't see any, you know, responses to this. So, you know, so let me, you know, comment on this. So one thing, you know, that now happens is because the Z maps to K actions, right? Intuitively, if suppose my K was equal to five and my episode length was hundred, so initially I had to plan for hundred time steps, right? But now I only will need to plan for twenty time steps. So in some ways, I'm reducing the time horizon of my problem. And that can lead uh, to better credit assignment, right? Because my time horizon is reduced. So therefore, it could benefit and improve performance. On the other hand, if you look at the sequence of actions that I'm predicting, you know, they're going to come from the same distribution as my original training set, right? Because I am trying to reconstruct my sequence of actions from Z. So I'm not going to try out action sequences, which are not there in my training set. But, you know, in some cases it is possible that you could visit, you know, more diverse states because, you know, for example, if you had to go straight, 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 you know, going 30 steps straight is very hard to happen by random chance. But if you were acting in the Z space, you only need to take six forward actions. That would mean that you have taken 30, you know, forward actions in the original action space. Right? So in some ways, you know, both the first and second are true. And maybe second is, you know, much more apparent. And the first one is, you know, maybe a bit more nuanced. Any questions or comments on that? I see, you know, something on the chat window. Uh, maybe, maybe I can ex explain my, my question. So. Uh, it seems to me on the right, you just want to compress the state into the leading space first, and then uh, predict the uh, series of uh, actions or skills, right? So my question is simply, why not directly train the, the, the uh, neural nets for both encoder and decoder on the right uh, at the first place, instead of doing this kind of like, uh, you, you phrase the decoder and then uh, train the encoder again, so. So, so suppose if you want to go to a new task, right? So you had demonstrations that were given for some tasks and then you wanted to do something new. Right? So in that case, you would need to modify how you're going to combine the skills, right? But then you don't want to relearn the skills again. So in that case, you might want to freeze your skills, but just learn how to combine the skills by training the encoder or by training this mapping from Z, S to Z. Does that make sense, Perry? So do you, it, it's just a, a way to, a simple way to learn the, uh, the actions from the demonstration uh, 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 data? Yeah, so, so this is one, this is a simple way. So if you look at what the decoder is doing, right? Decoder what it gives us is a bunch of skills, right? So I, what I can do is I can take demonstrations and reduce the demonstrations into some skills, right? And now, instead of trying to plan in the action space, I can plan in the skill space. Right. right? 
So suppose if I want to do some different task, right? So for example, consider you know the example that we had, you know over here, right? On the left, suppose I get demonstration in the maze environment, but then I want to solve this heist game, right? So I will now need to train my policy again on heist, right? So I have two choices. You know, one choice I have is that I train this whole system end to end on heist. Uh -huh. Right, right. Yeah. But that is going to be more sample inefficient. Yes, right? that's yeah, that's my yeah. I say, I say, I say your point. Yeah, all right. Okay. Thanks. Cool, cool, right? So there are you know a bunch of work which try to learn skills. I'm just you know referring to some of them. You know, we will probably you know spend more time on hierarchical reinforcement learning in the future but you know this is maybe a first look into a hierarchical architecture and these techniques of you know learning you know you can say learning skills or learning motor primitives all of them pretty much means you know a way of parameterizing where given some vector i can produce a sequence of actions right? so this can these ideas have been widely used you know, over here, I'm going to show, you know, some examples which are, you know, were popular or are popular. So this is the task of, you know, trying to put this ball in the cup. So over here, you know, Catherine gave one demonstration of it. And now I want to repeat it. Right? So if we just do imitation learning, you know, if we just have a few demonstrations, it is very hard to learn from. So instead, what we do is we take whatever demonstrations we have to learn some skills, and then we do RL with these skills. Right? And why do RL with these skills? Because it reduces my time horizon, and therefore makes RL training be faster. So what you will find is, you know, maybe after around hundred trials, you know, this agent will learn how to you know, go and solve the task, right? So this is, you know, one example. Now we can look at another example from, you know, this robot trying to play table tennis. So, you know, again, uh, you know, we demonstrate the task and you know, we use this task demonstrations to learn skills, which are then fine tuned, you know, to perform, you know, which are fine tuned to improve performance over here, right? So over here, first, what you're seeing is, you know, the ball is stationary, you know, this agent learns to hit it. And then you change the task, but you can reuse the same skills. Now someone is throwing the ball and, you know, now we are returning the ball you know, with this, this policy. So, you know, if you're interested, again, you can, you know, go and read, you know, these papers, but the idea is, you know, what we described, you know, you learn a movement template, motion primitive skill, then you fine tune that with some reinforcement learning policy. So, okay, so that's, you know, going through what we have covered until now. So we started with memorization and repetition. You know, the problem was that we could not handle any change in the environment. We went to behavior cloning. We looked at the problem of covariate shift. Then we looked at dagger to overcome covariate shift. Right? Then we came, okay, well, behavior cloning is still limited to the expert data. So how do we improve it? We looked at how do we combine with reinforcement learning. So first we looked at with replay buffer. Then we looked at combined behavior cloning plus RL loss. Then we looked at using Q filter to improve upon it. And then what we said was, well, maybe there is some more structure in my demonstrations. So I can take my demonstrations, do some skill learning, and then do RL. Right? And then we saw some examples where this paradigm was being used. So there is a question, is there a way to prioritize demonstrations which led to higher rewards 
while using them to train so you could do it you know for example the waiting term that you put when you have reinforcement learning for behavior cloning loss so if you think some demonstrations are better than the others you could make the waiting for those demonstrations be higher so okay now you know but the, now you know let's also look at some more you know techniques which can help us realize so you know let's consider you know this task of tying a knot with this rope so over here you know i think this is jonathan who is demonstrating this task you know he you know moves the robot around so that you know we can go and you know tie a knot so you look at you know how tedious this whole process is right it's not straightforward to give a demonstration right? so now we have a demonstration given starting from this rope configuration we can go and tie a knot but now you know what happens if you know the rope is starting from a different configuration right not the same configuration but something different so over here you know one idea that we can use is that i can transform this rope back to this rope by doing 3d registration right and once you know this rope is transformed into this one then i can apply the same sequence of actions right so this idea is called as trajectory transfer right so i mean just imagine if instead of this rope being red it was multicolored right then i could map which color is where right and then i can perform a non rigid transformation to align this rope with the rope shown on the left and then just copy over the actions so you know one way you can imagine to transfer is if somehow you can align you know your test case to be similar to your training case right so sometimes you know you can be clever or some problem setups allow you to be clever and perform such registration right and if you're able to do it you know you can use these kind of methods now this method is very specific to the task but you know something worth knowing that if you want to generalize the situations but you have demonstrations in a variant of that situation but if you have a mapping which can make you go from the new situation to the previous one then you can very easily leverage demonstrations over there so yeah and now let's look at you know one more uh, intuition about how we can transfer so demonstrations can communicate many things right so one thing they can communicate is how to exactly do the task that is for each state what action i need to perform but alternatively you know demonstrations can also communicate just the intent you know they don't tell me what or they don't tell me how to do the task but just what the task is and this can be useful because as we saw you know defining the what function can be quite hard so can we you know maybe use demonstrations to only communicate the intent now what do i mean by this let's suppose i have this you know ball which i can move in the x y direction and this ball could go to any of these three objects right the square the green triangle and the blue star now by giving a demo of moving this block or this ball towards the orange block i want to communicate the intent that you know if i have a new situation then i still want to go towards the orange block right? so over here the demo one is communicating the intent like if i just copy the actions over here this ball will go on the top right and will not perform the task so what we want the demo is to communicate the intent 
and then we need and then we can act in a new environment right so this is you know think of this as you know trying to overcome the covariate shift problem right by using the demonstration is just to communicate the intent and then trying to act and then using this intent to produce a sequence to of actions to act in a changed environment so you know how do we do this oh no this looks quite bad i wasn't looking that bad when i made it but anyway so i'll i will give you a more high resolution version of this slide so okay so the way we are going to do this is suppose we have you know two demonstrations one in which the ball goes from the center to the top right and one where the ball goes from the center to the bottom left so i want the first demonstration to communicate intent right so i have this demonstration i am going to feed this into a neural network and i'm also going to feed in my current environment in which the configuration of blocks is different to the neural network and then i'm going to predict the actions and i want these actions to match the actions corresponding to this environment so now what the network should learn is that if i have you know if in this demo i have the ball going towards the orange block then i should output the action which also goes towards the orange block if i have you know the the ball going towards the blue block i should always i should also output the action so that the ball goes towards the blue block right so one demonstration is communicating is trying to provide the intent and the second demonstration is where i am acting now the, for the training i need actions for the second demonstration but at evaluation time you know i can just predict the actions for this without needing access to actions so you know another you know a concrete instantiation of this is there's a demonstration happening over here and there's a policy which is trying to perform the task but look at you know that the configuration of blocks is different but we still want to stack towers in somewhat of a similar manner so i think over here we're going to try to stack you know maybe one tower which is you know has three blocks or maybe or i guess couple of towers which have three blocks or two blocks right so what you see is you know you are still able to stack blocks in the same way even though the block locations are different any questions on you know so i i think i went a bit fast on it so i'll take a pause and see if there any questions i think there's one question so how do we ensure that the intent is communicated correctly what if in the previous example the agent gets the impression that the moving to the top right is the task so the way we are ensuring this is that at training time you know for this new the second environment we have access to ground truth actions right so the agent you know for example over oh sorry if, if the agent you know were to move to the top right over here then these actions will not end up matching these actions right they won't have match the demo two actions so therefore there will be a high loss so now you are forced to take actions which move towards the orange block does this answer your question so any any questions from anyone else
Okay, so you know this work was called as you know one shot imitation learning. Why one shot? What does one shot mean? It means that I'm giving you one demonstration of how to do a task, and then you know I change the task or I change the environment setup, and I still want you to perform it. So I'm not giving you you know hundreds of demonstrations. And then asking you to execute the policy. I only give you one demonstration, and then I want to execute. So you know what we looked at now is, you know how we can use behavior cloning to transfer. Now, you know, so there are still you know a couple of concerns. You know, one, you know, we talked about things being tedious. And you know, second, as we will look at, is how can we make transfer work even better? So let's return back to this tediousness business. So one way to reduce how tedious data collection is to be more creative. So you know, one example of this is you know, using virtual reality to control my robotic system. So for example, over here, Zoe. Is moving the robot's arm through a virtual reality setup, which can make giving the demonstration, you know, much easier than maybe moving the robot on your own. So this is, you know, one thing you could do. Now, specifically in robotics, you know, there are other sensors that you could be using. For example, you can wear, you know, gloves. And these gloves have these sensors which measure your finger motion, so you can read off exactly how the human was moving his arm. So instead of me moving the robot, I can just move my arm and perform the task, and I also get you know what actions I took. You know, then you know people have also gotten more creative. Like for example, over here, you know, I think this is Ankur, I believe. You know, he is. You know, doing you know some motions with his fingers of how to perform the task, and this camera is estimating the pose of the hand, which is then being mapped to the pose of the robot, and the robot is performing the task. So you know, here are you know just showing you you know different ways of collecting demonstrations. Now. What you can also now there's so one line of collecting interesting demonstrations is to change the method by which the demonstration is being collected. The second axis is to say, well, you know, instead of getting expert demonstrations to do the task really well, how about you know I just let uh, you know uh, agent just play with my environment, right? I don't have a goal. But I will just let the agent play, right? And when the agent plays, it's going to do a bunch of stuff, right? Maybe it was moving these blocks, you know, without a purpose, but it will, you know, end up doing a bunch of stuff. Now, if I do a bunch of stuff, what can I do, right? I mean, one thing I can do is I can learn some skills, right? And then I can leverage these skills in the same way as we were using before. To do a new task which might be given to me, right? So instead of expert data, we can collect some play data, and use this play data to learn skills that I can use to go to a goal, right? So now, why this might be more uh, less tedious is because maybe to perform exactly a particular task, it is expensive, right? But maybe if we are just playing around. You know, getting data for that is cheaper. So you know, as we discussed, you know, earlier, we can get, you know, just this data, learn, you know, some kind of skills with it, and then execute these skills. Right. So now, what you saw initially. You know what we saw previously, right? We were mapping my current observation to Z, and then there was some action decoder which mapped Z into a sequence of actions. Right? So now what we have changed is that we have also conditioned 
the Z prediction on a goal, right? So I also have a goal image that I put as input, for example, over here. So one question, you know, you might ask is, you know, how, how does the play data compare against expert trajectories? Right? So what I would say, you know, look at the rightmost curves. Right? So what they're saying is, if I use the play data, which is this, you know, blue line and the purple line. So blue line, purple line come from two slightly different methods of how the play data is utilized. Versus if I had behavior cloning policy for 18 specific tasks, right? Then it seems like if I were using the play data, I can in general get better performance. Right? Now, why can that happen? Is because if I just allow, you know, maybe some agents to play with the system, then they can collect a more diverse set of data. And from that more diverse set of data, I can learn better skills. So, you know, this is, you know, the kind of skills this call, you know, the agent ends up learning. And on the left, you see a goal, and then the agent is executing the goal, which is being specified on the left. So over here, what the agent can do is, you know, there is like a goal, which is maybe not too far away, the agent is able to perform it. But sometimes, you know, we can have goals which are much more long horizon, right? For example, you know, maybe, you know, I need to open the microwave, you know, shift this thing and, you know, then open the, the cupboard, right? So how do we, you know, leverage skills to perform these tasks? So one thing to note in you know, some of these you know, videos that I'm showing you or tasks I'm showing you, that in most of these tasks, we are not working with images. We are working with a low dimensional state space. And right? what does the low dimensional state space mean? You know, you know the location of the object, you know the location of the microwave. So they're given to you as X comma Y coordinates instead of being given as an image. So, so to solve, you know, these long horizon tasks, what we can do is we can do learning from demonstrations at two levels, at a high level and a low level. Now, what do I mean by this is, you know, suppose I take this demonstration and I chunk it up into say equally spaced bins, right? Then I call all of my yellow things, which are say at a, you know, which are say five states away as my sub goals, right? So then what I do is I can say, given sub goal one and sub goal two, let me predict a sequence of actions, right? And that is what I'm going to call as a low level policy. And we're also going to train a high level policy, which says given my start and my end, I need to predict these high level goals. Right, which is given my current state and my goal state, I want to predict these you know goals which have inputs to my low level policy. So now let's consider if I have if I have to perform a task which has hundred steps. First, I predict some you know key states, which is shown by the top uh, policy, and then. Given these key states, then I fill in how do I go from current state to that key state. Does this make sense? Any questions on what I just described? Okay. So so what we can do is, you know, we can do this imitation learning first, and then as we saw, you know, we can do some fine tuning with reinforcement learning, which ends up improving performance. So we can see this more concretely. I have my environment and from the environment, I have two policies, a high level policy and a low level policy. 
So my current state goes as input to both my low level and the high level policy. The high level policy also gets the goal as the input and it produces a sub goal. So given the current state and the sub goal, the low level produces a sequence of actions. Right? But then at some point, the low level terminates. And then at that point, given that state and the goal state, the high level again outputs a low level goal. Right? And then this process you know, ends up repeating itself. So on one hand, you know, these kind of methods can solve, you know, some long-term tasks, but, you know, they also end up failing in, you know, many situations. If, for example, what you'll find is, you know, the system, for example, on the top left, it just, you know, freezes and, you know, it stops moving. So, you know, these methods are successful, but you know, they're still, so many things which need to be done to take them even better. Now, again, going back to this problem of basic cloning in serious, right? So one thing you can say is, well, you know, I don't really want to demonstrate how to do something by moving the robot. And maybe I can, you know, just see YouTube videos or I can observe some other human you know, how can we leverage that data? You know, these days, you know, there are many, many you know, good data sets that are out there on YouTube where, you know, many annotations are also available, like watch a person or walking or sleeping or, you know, many other things. Or there are also data sets of, you know, people just doing activities of daily living. You know, this is this VLOG data set, which came out a couple of years. And now what we want is, you know, for the robot to just see a video, for example, over here. So instead of requiring access to both states and actions, we only want to take states. And, you know, being able to learn how to predict actions from these. So, you know, what we have looked primarily in this lecture is learning from demonstrations or behavior cloning. I think what we're going to look in the future is how can we do observational learning, which is behavior cloning without actions. And, you know, there are, you know, a bunch of considerations uh, in this line of work, which we will look in the next lecture. Now, with that, I'm going to stop and take any questions which might be there.